Hey everybody, uh, my name is David Lotherington, this is Ian, and today I'm going to be channeling a looping being named Yang Shi, at least that's my understanding. Uh, Ian will be asking Yang Shi some questions while I'm in the channeling state. Channeling is me entraining my frequency to match that of the being who is being channeled, which is Yang Shi in this case. So my frequency goes halfway up and his goes halfway down and we meet in the middle. And when that happens, our chakras align. And that is the state of channeling. So I'm gonna get into the state and I have my friendly uh, question asker, Ian, to help me out. And here we go. And just to remind everybody, this will be our second conversation with Yang Shi. And if you're interested in hearing what he had before, to say before, that video is posted on David's YouTube channel. Yes. And I should also say that the goal of this is to get some information on uh, a species called the dogmen, uh, which I just found out about two days ago, um, and their purpose on Earth and some characteristics of the Lupine race as well. Um, so we're going to be digging, or Ian's going to be digging into some information uh, and get as much as we can from the species so we can get a better understanding of them to help with our future endeavors if we are to connect with them in the future and all of that. So I'm going to start uh, channeling and let's begin. Okay, we're ready. All right. Greetings, I am Yang Shi. Greetings, Yang Shi. Good to talk to you again. Yes, the pleasure is ours. Thank you for having us so we can present ourselves and our race to you. It is, first off, I just want to give you the, the opportunity to, if you want to give us an opening statement on what you would like to say to us today before we start, if you don't mind, with the question and answer period. Yes, we were notified of the conversation to take place some days ago. Uh, during this conversation, David's higher self or consciousness came forward to uh, ask us a few questions and it was our intent to come forth truthfully to speak truly on the content at hand, as it is important to help with the relations between humans and lupine and other of the canid species. Okay. Um, would you like for me to just go ahead and start asking you questions? Yes, we deviated from your initial question. We would say there are many changes happening on your planet at this time. Many of our species are monitoring the changes that are occurring and because they are changing slowly on the planetary level, but quickly on a political level, it is causing some disruption within your system. Pay mind to these changes. <clears throat> the channel's voice is better than it was last time for our depth of baritone, or this is not the right word, for our depth of tone regarding our voice, but it is still not optimal. As we would say before, as we said before, we normally have a very deep voice, but we cannot do this with the channel because it can cause some disruption in the vocal cords. So we will lighten our voice because we are starting to have cramps now. Very good. This is much better. Okay, last time we talked, you gave me a general description of yourselves as to the color of, you know, the fur that you have. And I understand that you have a lot of white fur with some blue undertones and the colors uh, amongst your species can vary uh, throughout. Um, and there was also variance between, you know, those of you who walk on two legs versus there are a subset of your species that walk on four legs due to genetic differences. But I wanted to ask you if you could provide us some more detail 
on your specific looks? Like specifically, what are the characteristics? What does your face look like in terms of your ears, your eyes, your teeth? Uh, is there anything that you can compare that to of which we would be familiar? Yes, there are many species on Earth that have similar characteristics uh, amongst your wolves and canine races. There are many variances, of course, because we are not from your planet and we have not evolved on your planet. But there is species that are similar. Our color is rather unique as we vary from shades of white to silver, light blue and into the indigo colors of, uh, of our fur. Our skin is ranges as well. Some of us have patches of pink, others have white skin and others have a blue skin underneath the fur. And the fur is apparent on the torso and also on the lips, the gums, the tongue, and underneath the eyebrows, you can see some of the fur coming through and in the palms of the hands and the base of the feet. And what color is your tongue? My tongue is a, a it is like a, uh, it is a light bluish color. It has tones of pink uh, near the back, uh, but primarily it is a lightish blue color and it almost looks like cyanotic tissue for a human. It would be tissue without oxygen within it. It becomes blue. It is something similar to this. Okay, I just asked that because in our own canine species, you know, they have red tongues, pink tongues, black tongues, yes. or even maybe even dark bluish. And I, so that's kind of maybe the same within your species as well. Yes, while we are on the subject of the tongue, we would say that we have large papillae. And now these papillae would be similar to the species that you have on your planet uh, named the tiger, where they are very raspy. It allows us to pull things in with our tongue as we consume it. So it is like a hand, but it is of the face. And how do you communicate with each other? Because do you have the ability to talk or is your talking ability only because you're able to communicate you know, telepathically through the channel and using his mouth to talk? Are you able to form words with your mouth and communicate that way, or do you have a different way of communicating? Well, we have several methods of communication. Primarily, our species communicates with each other through grunts, body language, and telepathy. It is, many of us can speak with a very low glottic rumbling the channel cannot do this, but it is, uh, it is a, a chest sound and it vibrates and other lupine can feel it within the chest. Now, our telepathy is not extremely strong, but it is far stronger than a human's telepathy. We can connect to our species and we identify other lupine beings using such telepathy. So if they are within a radius of approximately, uh, depends on the strength of the lupine, but approximately 30 to 40 feet, we can sense that they are in the area and we can coordinate our attack if we are attacking, uh, which helps with flanking measures and things of this nature. So, but we do have the ability to say some words we would not be able to move the mouth like the channel is now, but we can say some, it may seem like primitive words like planet of the apes. Uh, they do not speak very well, but they can say some words. Okay. And on the telepathy part of it, um, I think it's known that there's a lot of, I guess we would think, telepathic communication within our within our own canine species on earth on how they can coordinate and how they know automatically know how to do and, and organize themselves as a pack and they each have a specific function to fulfill and 
I guess maybe some of that's drawn on instinct. Others is just natural ways they have of communicating through body language, like you mentioned, um, maybe audible sounds, uh, but also there's a, a mental connection, a telepathic connection you're also suggesting, which I'm assuming, correct me, that the Lupian would probably be more advanced at the telepathic portion of it than our canine species here are on Earth. Yes, there is a key difference in the lupine and the canine species. And, and this is on Earth we are referring. And we would say that is because wolf or lup, lupine species, uh, um, we apologize, there are some disruptions. Lupine upon your planet, uh, the, the wolf species, they have some telepathy. We're having some trouble with our communication. They have some telepathy, whereas canines are much less adept in such a skill. Now, it is because of many years of evolution and also as a core trait of the, of the species of canine. Even the, the very sentient conscious beings of, are at a space stage of development, they have weaker telepathy than we do. So it is branching all the way to the top where they, their predecessors come from, from the Canis Empire. Now, we have an understanding uh, with amongst each other in our packs and our ensemblances of uh, family and connectivity uh, regarding tactics. So it is not required necessarily that we use telepathy. But if there is a sudden change in plans during the tactical move, then we can make changes during combat, uh, which can be very beneficial. So outside of a combat setting, let's say you're just within your own pack, relaxing, socializing what's your what's your primary way of communication is it telepathy or is it just a combination of that and, and maybe more just po body posturing uh you know your grunts or sounds hmm. um how do you just socially communicate with each other there are many gestures with the mouth that open that express communications that do not require audible sounds there is also um, grunts and vibrations that we stated before that say many things. We do not have extremely deep conversations like humans. It is not required. Uh, we live a very simple life. Uh, as you understand, we have a tribal understanding. Although we have space age technology, we still prefer to keep it simple. And with this understanding, when we are relaxing with our cohabitators or our comrades or loved ones, we often speak telepathically completely or with the gestures of the mouth and vibrations. Okay. And how about, do you have the, the ability to perform telekinesis, moving objects with your, with thought? Yes, we do. Now, it's our understanding that humans are very poor at doing this, and we have tested humans uh, for this in comparison to ours, and it is significantly weaker. Now, perhaps it is the particular individual who was tested at the time, we are not quite sure, but we can move things readily uh, up to a particular size. Now, we would say, objects about the size of a basketball can be moved by us through telepathy, uh, telekinesis, um, but not much larger than that. And do you, and do you use telekinesis in just your everyday normal life? Or is it something that you only use in tactical situations or in extraordinary situations where only it's required? It is primarily forbidden amongst our people uh, unless they are trained in matters of combat. Now, telepathy, uh, telekinesis provides many issues. 
uh, amongst beings that are not very skilled at it. If you think of something and it begins to move, it can be cause an issue if it is not well trained. Now our people do not use it often, but because we have been at war for so, such a long time, it has been standardized to be activated within us without, um, we would say at a particular age of development, each of us develops our telekinesis as a rite of passage. And it is a way, it is a ceremony that takes place that uh, lets everyone know that we are ready for the our stage of uh, teenagerhood, we would say. And uh, it helps us even though we do not use it. But it can be a very clumsy thing. If you think to grab yourself a glass of uh, juice from the fridge and you just think of it, you do not get up and go to the fridge, you might hear a a crash. Now, we said fridge, but we don't have a fridge. But what you think becomes reality with telekinesis. And so you have to be mindful of how to you, you use it. Okay. Getting back to your physical characteristics, uh, what color are your eyes? Ah. My eyes are yellowish golden color. I have brown lining uh, on the exterior of my eyes and yellow as if there were a yellow sun inside of my eyes, something. And, like is, that. and is that standard throughout your species or does eye color vary as well? It is somewhat variable. We are thinking of different examples. Some of us have the blue eyes like the husky. Uh, there are species of us that have lighter eyes than myself. I have a, a rich sun color, uh, perhaps it is better to say sunflower yellow, something of this nature. Uh, but there are species and comrades of my friends uh, that have lighter yellow eyes. Um, the red does not occur naturally with our species, but there are other species that have red eyes, but primarily it is a reflection that happens that causes the eyes to look red, but this is not the case. And with that, when you say red, would it be, are you familiar with, we have mice or rats here on earth and some of them, their eyes are just ruby red. Is that the type of red you're speaking about? Yes, it is the tapetum lucidum. It is a reflective membrane within the eye that causes a refractory of light to be sent back. And this is what you're seeing. The eye is not red. It is a reflection of light. Okay. And, and how is your eyesight in the dark? Excellent. Now we use a combination of techniques to see in, at nighttime, but as we use, we would say, we use telepathy to see. We also use our eyes, which have been enhanced through the, the tapetum lucidum, as we mentioned before, uh, which gives us ample eyesight, but our sense of smell, hearing, and eyes and telepathy are all enhanced in a way so that it is optimized for traveling at night. So we can see with many senses. Right. No, that brings me like my next question is going to be, do you actually primarily use your sense of smell to identify your surroundings as opposed to, you know, humans, we tend to walk out and we'll look both ways to see what's around us. And our canine species, I know with my own dogs and that I see, first thing they do, they walk outside, they stick their nose in the air hmm. um, to identify their surroundings. Is that similar to your species? Not myself, but others do this. Now, the reason for me not using it as much as my comrades is because I am an alpha. That means that I am greater at certain things than others that are not of the alpha, mm, spe not species. We are struggling for terminology here. 
Let me right. help you with the right. alpha t tier or rank. Okay, because I was good. My next line of questioning was going to be specifically uh, with the with the, with with the alpha rank, and I wanted, and also with the the royal the top line rank. We, we wanted to address something first. Okay. Please forgive us for interrupting. Now, because I am alpha, I have greater telepathy. That means that I use it more often. So I would send a burst telepathically outward. This would connect to anything conscious in my area, giving me a radius around me, approximately 30 to 40 feet of who is around me. Now, those that are not alpha or others that are not strong telepathically as myself, they may use the sense of smell to find similar results, although it is limited by range and accuracy compared to telepathy. Now, regarding your question, please continue. I was gonna basically ask you just a general question to start. What does it mean to be alpha? This is a very good question, and it is deep rooted in our collective as to what it is to be alpha. To be alpha means to be the apex of your species. It means to represent that which is the best of the best. And the best of the best can have many different meanings to many different species. Uh, perhaps we do not want to confuddle our definition of what it is to be alpha with a human's understanding of it. But we would say to be alpha is to be the most intelligent amongst the people. It is to be the fastest. It is to be the strongest of psychic ability. It is to be uh, the most loyal. It is to be the most uh, reflexive and virile as well is the characteristics of alpha. The last time we talked, you, 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 you told me about there are basically three different tiers within your, your, within your hierarchy. We said um, four, but yes. Or four, okay. And one of them was, you know, the top line would be the, like the royal. And then there was like in the middle was the alpha. And I don't remember what the fourth one was, but I know the bottom one was like the general population. And I, if I'm remembering correctly, it's like the tier in the middle interacts with the royal, with the royal hierarchy, and also interacts with the low, with the lower hierarchy. Are you that a bridge of communication, as like let's say a representative? of what's happening among your general species and and you communicate that to the royals as needed do you act as a, you know in, a representative for the low, for the loyal for, for the lower lower hierarchy does that make sense it does we okay. would clarify your question Please. because we have a greater understanding of the tier system than yourself at the top of the pyramid, if, or the center of the bullseye, de it depends how you look at it, we would say the center of a bullseye, for simplicity. It is the royals. The second ring is the alphas, which I am within. Now, the alphas can communicate with the royals, and they can communicate with any below them, as they wish. They have exclusive breeding rights and they can choose who they have as mates. The third tier is those who are not alpha, but are still lupine. These are the standard citizens of the, the people. Some of them may be warriors. Uh, they have different professions depending on their social status ranking. And the fourth tier, just to say quickly, is those of low genetic line, those that are not eligible to breed and reproduce due to genetic factors that they may have in the system that may corrupt the future generations of lupine. So does this help with the summation? 
Yes, one quick question on that is how do you prevent those from breeding, from reproducing? We have an understanding within our people. A population is not out of control. And because it is not out of control, we have governmental systems that can regulate uh, that which happens uh, amongst the lower tiers of society. We do not sterilize, this is barbaric. We merely let them know that they cannot have children. And it has happened before where they do have children, but they do not branch off like humans and form their own colonies. This is not something that happens. Oftentimes, if a human wishes to find themselves away from the the people, the government, they will buy a house and go off grid. Well, we do not have that situation amongst our people uh, because we are one unified race. And because we are telepathic, we are that much closer uh, than humans are to other humans. Okay, so if the lowest level has, let's say gen they're deemed genetically flawed, um, and if they're not, you have an understanding that they're not to reproduce, wouldn't that mean that they would just die out and that gene those genetic flaws would just simply die out? Yeah. If that's the case, what's continuing that population to continue to survive, live, given your long history or your long existence in the, in the universe? Well, we wish it to die out. We wish for the poor genetic traits to die so we can have a strong species. Uh, but there are times when there is mutations within the genetic codes of the offspring uh, that can be variably advantageous or non-advantageous and provide limitation uh, within the being. If it is non-advantageous, then it is put into the fourth ring. And there are several factors that one must have before reaching the fourth tier uh, with this understanding, because we have schooling systems that filter out and find out characteristics of the individuals before they are placed within the tiers. Okay. Um, going back to what it means to be alpha, uh, I think you last told me that being alpha means you can be both male or female. It does not matter. Um, Just to verify, we cannot, I cannot turn into a female. But an alpha can be a female or an alpha can be a male. Right. That, that's what I meant. I'm sorry. Uh, and you have communication with the royals. Um, but do the royals come to you for information about what's happening in the tier below you? So yeah. they have an understanding of what's happening and what may what changes may need to be done or directed? Yes. Okay. We are a filter for information. Some information is not important enough to bring to the royal uh, tier. And so we act as a filter, filtration system for content that is most important. And to this, we would say, it must be of a particular octave of importance. It must be there is a sickness in the colony. There is a colony that is not doing well because of lack of resources in the area. It must be because there is a disease or there is a predator in the area and they need to be notified of this. And what power does the royal aspect have? Meaning what do they issue directives on what actions to take and you then communicate that down to the levels yeah. and implement those directives? We reinforce the directives of the royal. So I am not just someone who listens to them and passes the orders down, although this does happen, but I also reinforce the directions that have been laid upon um, the people and the alpha from the royals. Okay, when you re when you say reinforce, that all this, can that also be interpreted as you enforce? Yes. Okay. 
Um, is there anything else about what it means to be alpha that you can think of that would be helpful for us to know other, other than what you've already stated? Well, alphas are permitted special circumstances of freedoms. We are permitted more food. We always eat first. We are permitted uh, an alpha of a group will also always represent and speak for the group. It provides us with a different tier of nourishment. There are some foods that only alphas are able to have because they are responsible for reproduction. They are responsible for keeping the, the pack strong. We are the apex of our species and it is important that we are taken well care of so we do not become sick, so we do not become uh, troubled. So we have special um, terms and conditions which others in lower tiers do not have access to. Okay, something you also said in the last time we spoke about that I've had questions since uh, this, went back and re-listened to it, and you mentioned that you have shamans. Yes. Can you tell me about the shamans? What hierarchy in which do they exist? The shamans exist in the second and third tier. Now, the royals have something that we would classify as a priest, but humans, priests are defiled in comparison. Would you call that a high priest, maybe? Perhaps something of this line. Or a high holy being, holy Lupian, something along those lines. We would say ones who communicate with angels, ones who communicate with the ascended ones of the collective. They okay. have greater ability to access layers of experience and expansion that we as alphas do not have access to. Okay, can you give a general description of what it means to be a shaman? What is it that what is what is it that shamans are tasked to do? Or what are their capabilities? Shamans are able to be alpha or they can be third tier, but one cannot be a shaman in the fourth ranking. A shaman is responsible for the health, well-being a healthy mindset, goal, setting goals and aspirations, and also treatment of poisons and toxins within the tribe. So there is not as many shaman as there are individuals. There is approximately one shaman or druid. We have several different esoteric positions but primarily we are shaman, we are druids, and we are priests. And are, and how does one become a shaman? Is it something they're bred into and have, or certain, have certain capabilities? Or is it something that is taught and learned? It is taught and learned, but it is also a, a nose is itchy. One moment. Very well. It is something that is a characteristic of the soul. So it is not a genetic factor necessarily. It is random, it seems, that shaman can be of any tier. And when they are of the royal tier, then they become priests. But if they are of any other tier, then they will become shaman and druids. Has this addressed your question? Uh, mostly, because I do have some follow-up questions. <clears throat> um, do they also, you mentioned they, they have communication with angels. Do they also perform rituals? And do those rituals take them into the spirit world? Do they have communication with the spirit world? We are starting to dip into things that I cannot tell you about but we would say that yes they have access to the spirit world okay 
I cannot I talk about the Royals freely. Understood. So primarily they're considered, you know, as we call them medicine men, primarily looking out for, for the collective, the well-being, uh, both physical and spiritual, the mindset. Is that an accurate description? You are referring to the shaman. Yes, I am. Yes. The druids have somewhat of a different nature. They are more involved with the plants, music, medicines, and uh, toxins than the shaman. The shaman are slightly different in the specialities. Um, so this is something to consider. Okay. Um, to switch topics, a question has come up in the last couple of days uh, that has been brought to our attention about a species that has been spotted on Earth by various people called the dogmen. Yeah. Um, are you are you familiar with the dogmen or dogmen as as a race or a species? We are familiar with them, but not friendly with them. Yes. And so you've had encounters with them that were unfriendly? Yes, this has happened many times throughout history. Can you provide us with a description of what they look like? They are more primitive than us. They... Yes. They are larger than us. They are, have relied on their size and strength and speed for their evolution. They have bred up in strength, reflexes, speed, agility, coordination, rather than intelligence. Now they are intelligent, but they are not as intelligent as our species. They are different, very different in their ways of life, in the way that they think. So they have a more survivalistic mindset than we do. Now, there's been a lot of reported sightings on them on Earth. So they seem to be prevalent on Earth. Are they an Earth species or, or did they come here from another planet? Are they of alien origins that, and, not, and now reside on Earth? They are not native to your planet, but they are there. Some of them are like space pirates, if you wish to look at it like this. And they do enjoy the peaceful, quiet flora and fauna of your planet. They live, uh, they are self-preserved. As we stated before, our slupine are excellent at balance. So they are able to self-regulate themselves in small colonies upon your planet without disrupting too much around them. But they are more mischievous than us. And sometimes they get themselves into trouble. Well, because the account, accounts that I have heard that they look very vicious yeah. And the people who have seen them are just very terrified of them because they just look so vicious and they're large um, and they fear for their lives. Are they a species to be afraid of or are their appearance or do they just look scary and really aren't that mean? They are not a species to be taunted. We will say this, their species, they have a very reptilian mindset. We would say they are dependent on size, strength, aggression is another characteristic of their species, which we do not hold highly. They are more aggressive and they take pleasure in showing how much larger they are than someone else. They do this amongst themselves. But when they come across a human who is only tiny in their comparison, then they enjoy the dominance that they 
and the fear, the smell, uh, that, and the urination of the human or defecation. So it is, they're also telepathic. We would tell you what they look like if you wish. Yes, please. Yes, they are ranging in height drastically, more than we range. We are approximately six to seven feet tall, roughly. There are some who are perhaps seven foot one or seven foot two, but it is quite rare. Their height ranges from seven foot three or seven foot four, all the way up to nine, nine foot two, perhaps. So they are quite large because of the genetic path that they have taken to become stronger and larger and faster and more ref reflexive. They carry themselves primarily on four legs, but they can walk on two, um, which is another variance within our species as we primarily walk on two legs. As we stated in the previous interview, if you recall, we spoke of another species that walks on four legs primarily, and they have a different skeletal structure. We understand that the channel has a picture of this species, and it will be posted here. Okay, um, so it's not wise for humans to go out and seek these wolfmen. <laughs> Not um, they can they can they they can be very dangerous. Pants. We will repeat the last transmission. Not unless they wish to shit their pants. <laughs> okay. They have an ability that they have derived through telepathy to be somewhat like the Mothman. And we will say this uh, to help you out on understanding. Their telepathy is groomed in a particular direction to produce more and more fear. And they extract some pleasure from making people paralyzed with it. And if they're not as evolved or as intelligent as the Lupian, hmm. how did they get here? I mean, are they able to have spacecraft and they do, can they have tech, do they have technology and in order to transport themselves to Earth? They are looping to be clear, but our species are different. They do have space technology, uh, but they choose not to use technology. So they use it very minimally. And these space pirates most likely It is possible that they have hijacked a ride from another species. Okay. Do you have anything else to add about their descriptions? Like I've heard, I think one witness's account that they have red eyes that I think if I remember correctly that they seem to glow in the dark. Yes, we did not give a good proper description of their species, nor did we ourselves truly. We will speak of them first. They are depicted as your wolf man with a large snout, stocky build. They have a hunched spine, which is naturally curved to help walk quadrupedally. They have haunches and hawks like a dog or a wolf in the back so they can stand quite tall when they are upright. They are extremely fast. You cannot outrun them. And you can, a human cannot defeat a species in person one-on-one. -on -one. It is impossible. Um, but their arms are very long. Their nails are very long. They have claws. We are bouncing around a lot. We apologize. Their snout is long. Their teeth are approximately two inches long. Their fangs are the canines, we would say. Most of their teeth are omnivorous, though. 
as they do consume berries, leaves, grass, other foliage, uh, but also flesh. Their eyes are not red, but they can be reflective into the red shades. And often, actually, they can range into the purplish shades of red uh, and also into the yellows. You have a question? No. Ah, your mouth made a movement, and we were observant of that. <laughs> I was just waiting for you to continue with your description of them. And then you said you were indicated you were going to move back to maybe describing yourself a little bit more in detail as well. Yes. They are not as intelligent as a human would be. But they are smart and species and not to be underestimated. It is our understanding that they are not extremely violent to humans. They are more menacing rather than dangerous, but do not underestimate their intent. They can be very tricky and they can even follow you to your house. But it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, is that they're on planet Earth and they're out in the wilderness, so wherever they're, whatever habitat they prefer, and they basically want to be left alone, but from time to time, they will encounter a human. Is that an accurate description? Yes. Or is there something more to it than that? There is more to it than that. They get bored. And this is an issue for the species. <clears throat> our voices come out of our comfortable register. Uh, but what we would say is that they get bored from rummaging around in the woods and they wish to do something fun. Now, because they do not enjoy technology, they do not have television. They do not have internet. So they are not able to entertain themselves in this such way. And it becomes boring tormenting deer and hunting them. So because of this, they love the white-tailed deer, by the way. Because of this, they stumble upon humans from time to time and take pleasure in monitoring humans and their behaviorisms. It is more likely that they will be located on the exterior of smaller towns and in more mountainous regions, but they do not have an extremely thick coat. So it is not likely that they are in mountains that contain snow. Now, is there other details of the physiology that you're interested in? Uh, the, just the one, one thing that came to my mind, the report that I, that I know about that I saw on a documentary, uh, I think it was in South America somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where. Um, so that fits in with, you know, they're not really adapted to their cold, but going back to their behavior and let's say, you, you know, that they can tend to get bored just rummaging around. So it sounds like they could be mischievous. Yes. And they take joy, in, you know, they find entertainment in doing mischievous things, whether that's scaring someone, you know, out of their wits or hunting or, or, or something like that. It that's is their primarily form of the of, it's primarily the act of domination that they love the most. Okay. So they like to be feared. And I think you mentioned they, they, they enjoy the sense of fear of others. Yes. Okay. Can we move back on to the Lupian and, and maybe you specifically on giving us a little bit more detail about your physical description? Um, you know, like I'm, I'm real interested in your head. The things on your head, your ears, and if you know they flop down, they straight up where they're at. Um. <laughs> yes, our ears are not apparent on the channel's body. They are upright. They are not as long as you might think. Now, 
many of us vary between the alpha line and the other tiers, they are different. So there are characteristics of alpha that other species, not species, other lower tier beings do not have. Sometimes alphas have more pointy ears. So like some ears might be triangular in shape or have a point yes. and others might have more of a curvature, more of a rounding of their ear. Yes, many of us have tips on our ears that look like lynxes, if you know the species of cats. Yes. And bobcats also have something somewhat similar. But we do have pointed ears. I have pointed ears. Not all of us do have very high pointed ears, but the rank, it is, a, it is complicated. There is ranks dependent on ears height and it is a high born characteristic to have high pointing ears, we would say. I have a ridge, we will try to move the hand, that runs up the middle of my head, similar to your mohawk hairstyle. It is, we are not versed in moving the body. It goes up like this, we would say. It is normal for the canines to have this crest um, but it is more developed in us. One moment. Like I said before, my eyes are like a golden color in the middle and they have a brown ring around the exterior. My eyes are larger than yours, but because the proportion of my body is larger than yours. If I was a human size, my eyes would approximately be the same as yours. My skin is a bluish color. My fur is silvery white. And I do have some black on the tip of my hair to be very specific. We have whiskers. Our snout is not as long as the dog man as you're depicted. It is sno snorter. It is shorter. And it, our jaws are more powerful. Now we have serrations on our teeth, if you are to look at them. The channel has no such characteristics. Our canines are long. They are approximately two inches long. So we may look something like a saber-toothed tiger. Mm, this is an, too great of an exaggeration, uh, but it is smaller than that, of course, because they are approximately a foot and a half, even 12 inches to a foot and a half long, uh, which is atrociously long and not purposeful, we, we believe. We believe it was a bred characteristic, but we are deviating. Now, as we stated, our tongue can vary in color. We have long raspy tongues like the tiger of your planet. We have long hair on our face. We are thinking of other things to explain. How about your tail? We do have a tail. It is not often, it is not used for balance. It is not so much an appendage. It is primarily used for quafting smells. So it is rather rudimentary uh, that we have it. Uh, is it also used for communication? Yes. Like right. canines, you know, like a dog with a wagging tail, if it wags a certain way, it's happy. If it wags a different way, it's it's a sign of aggression. Is, is your tail used similarly? Not quite. We would say that the dogs perhaps have two different things that they do with the tail, and we may have 50 or 60 different things that we can do with our tail uh, to show some sort of communication. Okay. And between the alphas, the alphas and the royals, are there, are there any characteristic differences between the alphas and the royals? Like, is there a trait that only belongs to the royals besides their bloodline? Yes, they have no fur, which is a significant difference to us. 
We are just seeing what we are allowed to tell you. The snout is slightly longer than ours. We have to check with each detail if it is permitted. They are thinner than us. By a lot. They are leaner in general than us. Though they are still quite muscular, proportionately. Do they ever have a problem with genetic defects when they breed? On rare occasion, this can occur. And what happens to that genetically affected individual? Is it kept in the royal family or does it get moved to the bottom tier? It will never reach the bottom tier. But there are places that they can still have use. They will not be able to reproduce but they will still have some roles within their society. So they still retain the royal status. Yes. Uh, regarding the characteristics, their fingers are more advanced than ours. We have fingers and hands as you do. We do not have paws on our front. And our back feet have long toes. So it may seem like we have, our toes are much longer than yours, approximately three inches. Uh, and then we have the nail, which is approximately one inch. And this helps us to balance, to sprint, and to help with jumping and things of this nature. So we are very fast. We jump very high, approximately 16 to 17 feet, uh, we would say from a, a rather slow sprint. And if I can touch on the royal family a little bit, I mean, you came through, we last, we last talked and um, you wanted to explain, you know, your species to introduce yourself to us, uh, express your willingness to perhaps engage in some type of trade in the future whenever contact is made, openly made, I should say. Um, is there a desire for any of a member of the royal family to talk to us directly? We would need to speak with them and ask them first. We are not permitted to speak on their behalf. Okay, because I, I don't know if, if, if that would be beneficial to them um, or I didn't know if you were, you know, quote unquote, designated as their spokesperson for your species. No, I am not. And you would have to be versed in how to properly address them. So there would be a protocol that I would have to follow in order to have a conversation with them. Yes. Well, if they do want to talk to us, then I guess I will have to have another conversation with you to let me know what those protocols are. Very well, we would take this into consideration and speak it amongst our peers. Okay, because I think um, I would like to learn or you know, be able to communicate with the royal family and get their views on things. Um, maybe have the opportunity to ask some questions. And um, of course, they probably you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions they have for us. Very well, we will express this to our comrades to see what they say. And then we will see if the council has anything to say about it. Okay, we're just extending an invitation. Thank you for your invitation. I don't think I have any more questions off the top of my head. I guess, let me let me ask, I guess I do. Let's go on, uh, on the spiritual side. What are your spiritual beliefs? And, and by that, I mean, when, what are, what are, what are, what happens when a Lupian dies? Is there a, a process that you go through that you can, that you know of? of what happens to your soul? Are you reincarnated? Are you only reincarnated as a Lupian or are you reincarnated other places? Uh, 
do you have discussions with ascend do you have ascended masters within your own race that your shamans communicate with not Those, the shaman but the priest communicate with the ascended ones we would say there is some protocol to death the shamans druids and high priest are well versed in the transit transitory period that exists uh, between life and death they help to usher in and out of life and to say this means that the shaman help giving birth as to the druids and any who are available that the shamans help with death and as do the druids but only the priest can give them the final acceptance into the space that is death so this helps with keeping uh, we would say loyalty to the royals okay and what about reincarnation well we have different beliefs than you we believe that there is a place that we go after we die is like your teldrassil which you are familiar with from your norse understandings it is a realm of peace a place where warriors can revel enjoy themselves and be gracious for the wonderful life that they have experienced so is so is that mean once they've once they've crossed over into the death that they go to this place of peace, that they're not reincarnated in your belief into another being somewhere? Not that, they're, that their rest is eternal? Not before they have a chance to celebrate their life in the afterlife. And then they will be reborn. And it is possible. We do believe in reincarnation, but it is somewhat different from your concept of it. Okay. And so in order, and from your understanding, I mean, is how does one get to be an ascended, an ascended master? Is it from the process of, you know, birth and rebirth and acquiring the wisdom? Or is there another process that happens in the spiritual realm that causes one to ascend, to become an ascended master. They are rare. It is a characteristic of the soul that comes forth and it can choose any tear that it wishes when it comes. There are some exceptions to our rules of tear systems and they make the exception the case. Although they cannot go and reproduce with royals. They can live amongst them if they are these rare situations. And this does not happen very often. And outside of the shamans and the high priests, do alphas or, or any individuals, do you have spiritual or religious practices or rituals that you do? Whether it may be to honor God or whether to be honoring, you know, uh loved ones that have passed on we have a ceremony which involves celebrating the warriors who have died in combat now we are starting to talk about things that we do not wish to share at this time okay it was something that oh that's where a lot of my interests lie and so i just wanted to understand if i could uh different views and and how it may be different for different species in different parts of the universe so i appreciate you being able to share what you have and hopefully sometime in the future maybe we could have a more in-depth discussion about your beliefs because for some reason the dying process and how it's known to humans or how it is, I should say, how humans believe it to be in various forms. I find it interesting. And I would find it to be interesting 
with your species as well. Very well. This is an honorable thing to ask, and we can tell that you are asking with good intent. So we will take this into consideration when sending the next who is to communicate with you. It may not be myself. If another comes forward, then they will be better versed in this such topic than myself. Okay, great. Well, Yan Chi, it was great talking to you today. I really don't have any more questions for you. I appreciate your time and coming back and clarifying and getting into some more detail and let us know. I'm sure you'll let David know if you wanna come back <clears throat> and we'll have some more discussions. Thank you, Ian, for your time and for the work that you have done for the collective of humanity. We understand that not many are able to ask questions that are of quality to help civilization itself. But for you, you have done quite well in our eyes and for those that we communicate with aboard our craft. So we would say thank you for your time, your experience, and your methodology for asking questions. Well, thank you very much for the compliment. I appreciate that. You're welcome. And we will leave you now and return David. Okay, blessings to you. Farewell.